how should the, the decision of taking a neuro, uh, stem cell therapy, how should this decision be taken? Where the patient, where the, the parent of the patient can bring the, patient, the, 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 the child, okay. and uh, if I can say, where not to take him to? Mm. All right, so you're asking what should be the criteria? There's the uh, criteria and the process. Mm -hmm. and the process. And when not to take it. Mm -hmm. That's the second part. So we never talk about when not to take it. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I, as a basic policy, and as a professional courtesy, I never criticize any professional career, and I never criticize any other center. Of mm -hmm. But I can talk about what we do. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and this is something we believe in. We are practicing what we preach. So this should be the criteria according to me. First, if you notice, you, you've all been here okay. uh, We only treat neurological patients. You notice, we do not treat uh, anything else. We don't treat orthopedics, we don't treat uh, nephrology, kidney, liver, heart, no, nothing. So we are, to the best of my knowledge, one of the only very centers that treats only neurological patients. Now, this is my belief. I believe that cell therapy, should be done by doctors in that domain. So where if it's mm -hmm. autism, it should be done by a neurologist or a neurosurgeon or maybe even a psychiatrist, somebody who understands the brain. So we don't treat we don't treat liver, you're a gastro person. I don't treat liver <coughs> cirrhosis. You know, there's a role for cell therapy mm -hmm. in liver. Uh, there is in fact there, there are papers that show that uh, cell therapy may replace liver transplantation. There's a role in nephrology, in chronology in say but we don't treat that. All the patients come by. Because I don't understand the liver. I don't understand as well as you would, for example. You know? So I believe it is wrong. I believe it is completely wrong for a non-specialist to treat something which he doesn't understand. You agree with me? I mean, I you know, just like in your practice, yeah. would you ever treat a patient with a, you know, a cardiac condition? It's or not possible. I can't. Person? I don't <laughs> understand. But unfortunately, uh -huh. there are doctors, yeah. cancer therapy centers where, which are not run by neuro doctors, you know, they're they are run by other specialists who are treating neuro patients. So that is wrong in principle. Because we don't treat, I'm not talking about what others should do, I'm talking about we don't do outside. Okay. And I believe uh, only people in that domain area, okay, in neurology should treat uh, autism and any other neurological condition. So that's the first thing they should decide. They should ask, is the main doctor, the person in charge there, a neuro person or not? Step one. Uh, the next thing, and here I want to add and um, talk about us. Not only are, see, I'm a neurosurgeon, okay, and uh, <coughs> my whole life I've dealt with the brain and different aspects of the brain, but the rest of our team is neuro as well. So, for example, Dr. Nandini, after doing her MD, did four years stem cell and neurodevelopmental disorders. She's India is in fact only qualified stem cell expert in Europe. Our uh, laboratory person, Dr. Prerna Bare, who's the head of our stem cell lab, she's a neuropathologist who's trained in, in the United States. And our, uh, our chief of rehabilitation, Dr. Jacob, he's India's senior most, most respected neuro rehabilitation person. Okay. Um, we have people qualified and trained in, uh, in the United States, so Dr. Himangi, for example, is an MD from the United States. Our occupational therapy head, Dr. Hema Biju, was uh, trained and worked in the United States before coming here. And she was a certified occupational therapist there. So we have very qualified people, and I think this is important. You have to not only see who heads it, but what is the team? Who else is there? Okay, so that's the first thing a parent should look at. The second thing, and this you will appreciate as medical people, is in our world, in the world of medical, your results have credibility only if they are published in peer-reviewed journals. Why? Because what somebody else says, we don't know what mm -hmm. they are claiming. I, you know, anybody can say, I have this result, I have that result, my patient starts talking in two months, my this happens, that happens. Anybody can talk anything. There is no validity, there is no proof. The only way to know whether it is correct is if the results have been published in peer review journal. That's what we do, right? We yes. publish our work. Why peer review? Because when we send our data to a journal, 
you know, the editor, the editorial board, and at least three independent reviewers review that data. The they yes. ask us back and forth. They ask us for this thing. They don't do it for us. They do it because if they print, publish something wrong in their journal, their journal gets a bad name. So they do it for themselves to protect themselves. But they verify our data. So the next question anybody has to ask when you want to decide which cell therapy center to go to is, is their work published? in international or national peer-reviewed scientific journals, preferably PubMed index journals, because PubMed index journals are a little higher quality. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we have a total of 106 scientific papers, mm -hmm. peer-reviewed papers, in all our neurological studies, 106, right, in different neurological conditions. Uh, in autism itself, we have 15, of which we have the world's first paper, the world's first scientific paper on cell therapy in autism has been published by us. The second paper came from China, the third paper came from Italy and Ukraine, and the fourth and fifth paper came from Duke University that you are talking about. And not only, now this you will appreciate as medical people, not only do we have the world's first paper, but that paper has been cited multiple times. Uh, of you know, There's something called citation, that other people mm -hmm. cite citing your work. So we have 131 citations of our first paper. Okay. So this gives credibility. So the answer to your question next is, uh, if they have scientific papers published, then that's, that data can be trusted. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you cannot trust that data. Mm -hmm. uh, the third thing, uh, of course, this may not be our criteria, but this is something we do, uh, is that, uh, you know, there are medical textbooks. And in medical textbooks, you have chapters. And then, when, let's say you're writing a, a textbook, and you're looking for authors all over the world, who will you look for? You look for people with the most credibility and authenticity. Mm -hmm. So you need to know that, you know, there's a textbook, uh, Recent Advances in Autism, where the they've introduced, first they've introduced a chapter on stem cell therapy in autism. And then when they looked at who in the world will write, they asked us. That chapter is written by us. Similarly, there is a book on cerebral palsy. You know, uh, uh, the book has got all treatments of cerebral palsy, but there is a paper, uh, on stem cell therapy and cerebral palsy, they asked us to write it. Similarly, one on uh, you know pediatric disabilities, on intellectual disability, and you know so many others. So we've got a whole lot of chapters in medical textbooks. So when an editor all over the world is looking for who will write a chapter, they come to us. Now there must be some reason yeah. why they're coming to us and not going to others, okay? Because they also want credit when you're writing a book. You want the authors of your book to be credible, you know, authentic yeah. people. So we have multiple chapters in different textbooks in muscular dystrophy. We have two chapters in muscular dystrophy, like that in uh, you know different different books we have. So that's the next part. The third is you have to verify the what is that clinical experience. Okay. So yeah. we have how many patients? Now you notice when you come here, your patients get a NG number. Okay? Mm -hmm. And you notice yours will be somewhere almost close to 13,000 now. So our first patient we treated was NG number one. And we have a series. So all our patients are documented with a serial number. I mean, it's not, you know, and it's come up to now to almost 13,000. Oh. So uh, we have now the world's largest experience. 13,000 patients, there is no center hospital in the world that has treated yes, anywhere over 10,000 patients also of neurological conditions with cell therapy. Because with numbers, there are two things. What is the importance of numbers? First, with numbers comes expertise and safety. The more you do something, the safer it becomes and the more better you get at it. Okay. So that is the importance of numbers. You know, you're a gastro surgeon. Mm -hmm. the, the more liver transplants you do, the more better mm -hmm. you get at it. We all have what is called a learning curve. When people are just starting, there is an earlier learning curve. Once you've established yourself, that, that goes away. So we have treated the largest number of patients in the world in of different neurological conditions. 13,000 uh, in all. And we have treated patients from 75 different countries. That again is a question. Why will people from 75 countries come to India? And this is, you know, you've flown maybe 15 hours, I think, you know, from Australia, and you people have flown 8, 10 hours, and people are coming mm -hmm. from here. You've seen here in this building, you see people from the United States, and from England, from all over the world.
people are flying 20 hours and coming here and they came through COVID, through the lockdowns, people were still flying and coming here. We've had mothers who've come with two children. We've had pregnant mothers with coming with their child in COVID. Okay. I mean, there, there has to be some, I mean, there has to be some reason why people are traveling from such long distances. And the reason is, you know what? The reason is, they have seen another child who has improved. Okay. So then they don't care about what anybody else says. You know, when we ask parents, how do you hear about us? Yes, we do. They say, <coughs> Well, my child used to go to rehab little center. I saw this other kid who could not speak, who's now talking. Or this child who was in a wheelchair. Now the parents don't care. <coughs> they say, we want to go to this place because something happened here. With this other child. So that itself, uh, you know, uh, makes a difference. So uh, apart from that, the other thing that, now this is our suggestion, is we believe that the autologous therapy that we do, take from the patient, put it back in the patient, is safer as compared to allogenic. This is our belief. If we be wrong, the people who do allogenic counter that. They say, no, theirs is safer because they just give it IV. Uh, it is, but my, my question to them is, one, if it is so great, how come it's not published and where is the proof in the data? We've got PET CT scans. You've seen your PET CT yeah. scan. You've seen the damage area and you've seen the repair. Right? You've actually seen the brain getting bad function. Now these machines, PET scans are made by General Electric and Siemens. These machines are standardized across the world. Yeah. There are machines anybody can mess around with. So there is, when that machine, a GE machine is showing there was damage and now it's better. Okay? That's actual objective proof of the fact that it is improving. Now I haven't seen the data. I haven't seen the data that we present from anybody else and one of the things that a parent must ask is what patients have been treated, what, what is the clinical improvement, what is the objective improvement. Because you have to show objective improvement. Otherwise, how do you know, you know whether the child is improving or not improving? <coughs> so, the therapy we use, like I said, is the safer autologous and we believe safer autologous is better than allogenic. Uh, in addition to this, we have, as you all have seen here, a very extensive rehabilitation facility. Majority of the centers that I know don't have it. In fact, I don't think anybody has the rehab that we have. Comprehensive, which includes basic rehab, that is occupational therapy, speech therapy, psychological therapy, physiotherapy, special ed. But also has specialized rehab, like sensory integration and uh, like aquatic therapy. Right now, our place is getting renovated, but you know, you may have seen the aquatic therapy earlier. We've got a fantastic aquatic therapy facility. We, we believe that all these advanced rehabilitation, so we have all that under one roof. So, we, we are not just doing the safe autologous, but we also have rehab. In addition, we also have the integrative, so the hyperbaric oxygen, you know, the, <coughs> the ozone, the supplement, all of that, the gut cleansing. So this combination is something that parents should look for. Okay, I mean, do you do we have all these therapies that are available? Because we believe it's a combination that works. Yes. So this is roughly uh, what parents. I'll repeat. First, my recommendation is parents should go to a center that is headed by a neuro doctor, a neurosurgeon, neurologist. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody with neuro, okay? the entire team there should be neuro based. They should have scientific publications, very important. You will appreciate that as medical doctors. If the work is not published, mm -hmm. see, when you are doing something new, innovative, you need to publish that data. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, like I said, we do the safer form, it's combined with rehab and uh, integrative therapy. And the other thing that we have, which again parents must ask for, is we have, and you'd appreciate that, we have what is called an institutional ethics committee, like your hospital will be having. Mm. So uh, in America it's called IRB, institutional review board, in India we call it institutional ethics committee. Now these ethics committee are registered with the Ministry of Health, with the CDSCO, which is the equivalent of the FDA. In America you have the US FDA, in India our FDA is called CDSCO, the center, mm. and then their state FDA. So we have an institutional ethics committee that is registered with uh, the Ministry of Health. 
Now, this is very important. Why is it important? Because when you have an institutional ethics committee, what are the institutional ethics committee consisted of? You know that. They are outside people. They are respected doctors, yeah, so senior doctors, researchers. They even have non-medical. They have a social worker there. They have uh, you know somebody from a uh, religious background. They have lay people. Uh, they are scientists. So, this committee actually looks at, we have to submit our proposal, what we want to do. And the committee gives an approval. So, this is something called oversight. Okay. So, that's another question that a parent should ask is, does your hospital have an institutional ethics committee that's registered with the Ministry of Health? That's very important. Yes. You, can, you can just have an ethics committee. Mm-hmm. But the registry committee. Why? Because the Ministry of Health goes so, through all the people who are on the committee. It gives an approval. It sort of registers it. Okay. So, now there is an indirect oversight uh, by the government through the institutional ethics committee. 